Hey, so I'm Michael Evans. This is joint work with uh, Thomas Dubasson that I've done during my postdoc at Portland State University. So a little bit of the background on this. At Portland State University, we're implementing this language called Habit. And as it's a language designed for high assurance systems programming inspired by Haskell. And as part of it, uh, part of the primary implementation, we use a nanopath style. Now, Habit itself is not the topic of this talk, so you don't need to know anything about Habit, but it is implementing that pilot is the motivation for a lot of this research. So in a nanopath, so this is a diagram of the passes just in the front end of the Habit compiler. With the nanopath style uh, compiler, each pass is designed to be very, very simple so that we can make sure that we really understand what this pass does and we, we don't and attempt to avoid bugs in that way. However, there are some consequences of doing it this way. The first consequence is that you end up with lots of passes, as you saw on the previous slide. We have about 30 passes in the front end. The other consequence is that most of the work that these passes is doing is traversing the data structure. For example, suppose late in the population pipeline, we need to mangle identifiers. That is, we need to remove bad identifiers like colons and periods and replace them with some other encoding that, that the linker will be happy with, so Z encoding and GHC. Well, mangling a single identifier, okay, that's meaningful work. We have that up here. Some implementation is actually doing some work there. But to uh, mangle all the identifiers in a program, I have to do all of this other traversal. Okay, well, when I get to a variable, yeah, okay, I call off the mangle ID. But when I do an application, I'm not doing any meaningful work. I'm just recurring down further and further. And this is not only for expressions, I have to hit every single data type in, well, not necessarily every single data type, but most of the data types in my, in my program, including case clauses and patterns and declarations, lots of work. Fortunately, there are known solutions to this problem. Generic programming. Scrappy boilerplate has been around for a number of years, widely used, some stock GHC, and fairly easy to write. I mean, this three, these three lines replace all of those other lines I had on the previous slide. Unfortunately, Scrappy boilerplate is kind of slow. I want to point out a few things on this diagram. This is uh, the runtime performance of Scrappy boilerplate normalized relative to handwritten code. So here we see that Scrappy boilerplate is 10 times slower. Up here we've got it 100 times slower than handwritten code. These benchmarks are borrowed from the GHC prelude for, uh, for the handwritten code, uh, the GP, bench, GP bench benchmark, which is a generic program, programming benchmark. However, unfortunately, that benchmark is intended more for feature benchmarks of systems, and it only contains a few performance benchmarks of generic programming systems. So we had to write several other, uh, in order to flush out the benchmark system, several other benchmarks. Uh, as I mentioned, and as you can see, we're on a log scale. The results are so bad, I have to do that in order to be able to see all the results. And the error bars, which you can't really see because they're so tiny, um, the error bars are one standard deviation. I think you can maybe see the error bar up there. OK, so scrapping boilerplate play is slow. What about some other systems? Well, we tried a few systems, and OK, well, we got to four times uh, slower. Than, uh, than handwritten code, but even in instant generics or Uniplate, uh, there are bad cases where it can really blow up. Now, the one system we did find that works, works well and performs well is Geniplate. Unfortunately, it requires that all traversals be a, a uniform type traversal. So for the, what this means is that the type that you're doing interesting work at must be the same throughout the entire traversal. So for mangling identifiers, that's easy. The interesting work is only at identifiers. However, for name freshening and many other traversals, the interesting work could be at any binding form, so pattern matches, uh, case clauses, declarations, and so on. And those aren't really expressible cleanly in uh, Geniplate. So our objective with all this research was to get something that is as fast as handwritten code. We really want that performance because we're doing so many passes that if those are slow, those are going to kill our compiler. We want it as easy and expressive as Scrappy boilerplate, 
and we want it to run on stock GHC to work with our existing compilation pipeline. So, you know what? If handwritten code is beating all of these generic programming systems, why don't we just run handwritten code that was written by a computer instead of written by a human? And that's the central idea behind the template your boilerplate system. So here's an example of using template your boilerplate. On top, I have the scrappy boilerplate code, and on the bottom, I have the equivalent template your boilerplate code. So the dollar parentheses are template Haskell notation for this part must be run at compile time. And this part is going to generate an AST fragment that represents the code that then, then should be run at runtime. So it's going to splice in, it's going to do, do some code generation, splice in that result, uh, and then continue compilation. The quote here is also uh, a literal for the identifier uh, Mangle ID, it's a quotation form. And when you do this and you do all the extra work, we perform very well. Now I'll, ex I'll cover why we've got these weird blips at the end. But in general, we are matching cycle for, well, not necessarily cycle for cycle, but <laughs> close enough you can't see it on the graph. <laughs> the performance of handwritten code. Okay, so if we're going to base our design on, go with a similar design to template to Scrappy Boilerplate, let's review a little bit of the ideas behind Scrappy Boilerplate. Suppose we've got a data type, list of int, and we're going to, going to be manipulating that. Tracker Boiler Plate starts with a, the gfoldl function. Now the gfoldl function has a really confusing type, and a lot of people get caught up on that. But if you look at the reductions, it's, it's really a rather intuitive operation. The z function to gfoldl tells us what to do to the constructor. So if we're being applied to nil, we apply z to nil. If we're applied to a cons, we apply z to a cons, and then have to do some other work for each of the arguments. And the k function tells us what to do for each of those arguments in order to apply each of them. Now, we build, within Scrappy Boilerplate, we build up on top of that a single layer traversal. So gmap t. What this does is apply the function f to every child node, only the immediate child nodes, not the descendants, to every child node of the constructor. Again, we've got the definition up there, but if you just look at the reductions, it's a very, very intuitive operation. We've got other operations for doing, uh, doing this monadically and doing this for query where we compute results from each child and return a list of those results. Once we have those one layer traversals, we can move up to multi-layer traversals. And the way we do this is very simply do the, multi do the full traversal on each of the children and then do the work that we want it to do at the current node. And that, that defines a bottom-up uh, bottom full traversal over the entire tree. Okay, so what happens when we translate this design to a template Haskell setting? So, THFoldL, again, slightly confusing type, ignore that. Uh, look at the reduction. So we, we're going to have to tell, tell it exactly what type we want it to generate code for. So when we tell tfoldl, let's do it for list, it's going to generate code that will take a list e, <coughs> case match over that list. And if it's a nil, it's going to do whatever we work, work we specified with z. If it's cons, it's going to do whatever work we specified with our combination of z and k. Note here that the k has to take an extra type argument, so I'm a little cheating with the subscript syntax in order to get it, clean, uh, to, get it to look clean. Now, once we go to these multi, go to the next layer, the single layer traversals, is a few catches. It's something that goes a little bit wrong. This is the implementation of THMAPQ, and the, the interface of THFoldL forces us to, to write it this way. Uh, in, when we write it in terms of this, this folding operation, we end up with these pens. Well, we don't need those pens. We know there's always going to be exactly two, two arguments. We may as well just cons rather than append. Now, maybe the compiler will optimize that away. But this is worrisome. It gets worse with uh, THMAPM. Because now we've got this return and we've got these apps that go in. And what app does is it takes the left hand argument and the right hand argument, does a uh, binds over them, and then returns applying the results of those binds. App has a return and two bindings in every call. 
a human would never write the code like this. This uh, up above is exactly the same code as I showed before. A human would be more likely to write the code similar to what's below, where you have yes, where you have only two bindings and one return. Now, hmm, can we do better? Well, we can if we change the interface that we're dealing with. Instead of specifying that it must be a fold, which scrappy boilerplate has to has to do because of how the typing how the types work out. We can specify it in terms of this G function that we're going to pass to G. We're just going to tell it, you need to handle this case, and here's the constructor. Here's the list of arguments that you need to do. You do whatever recursion, whatever fold, whatever style you want to do. The, the, the TH case doesn't care about it, whereas TH foldL enforces a certain, a certain style. Using this, we can implement TH map Q so it does it right. Uh, Comses instead of at instead of appends, and thmapm right, so it's only doing two bindings and one return. Now we've got one layer traversals. We need to move up to the multi layer traversals. Here again, we've got to be careful because inside, suppose we're traversing over that list type, the recursion is over the type, not the data. thfoldl recurs over the data because it's at runtime, it has the data. We are at compile time. And we're generating code that at runtime will uh, traverse over the data. So our recursion is over the type. This recursive call to everywhere f, if we expand that, that's going to contain another recursive call to everywhere. That's going to contain another recursive call. We're never going to terminate because the list type is cyclic. So we can solve this. Memoization. Uh, Basically, what we're doing here is that instead of whenever, anytime we see a recursive, anytime we see a call for a type that we've seen before, for example, on a list, instead of generating that code, we say, well, I'm going to introduce a variable, in this case I call it mem list, and I'm going to have you reference that. And I'm only going to generate one instance of that, of that, uh, that function. Okay. A few lessons we learned from all this. And once you, once you get up to that level, the rest goes through. It's all very straightforward code. It's generating code very similar to what you would expect. Lessons from this. Once we started benchmarking, we discovered several things. It turns out template uh, world can go faster than naive handwritten code. Keep in mind, many of these benchmarks were written over AST types that have about 100 constructors. This was over the language.haskell as syntax data type. Well, if we're looking for identifiers, and that's the only interesting operation, it turns out there are no strings. It's impossible to find an identifier inside the string. So we may as well skip that part. Same for, uh, string, same for literals or source locations. Now, a human could do this. However, if a human wanted to do these optimizations, it would be a maintenance nightmare. Because with identifiers, it's fairly easy to calculate what types can contain what other types. But for other types in your traversal, that might vary. It might even change as you're maintaining code. Today, your type, your type to type, uh, might not contain identifiers. Maybe tomorrow they will. And you have, you have a, a maintenance <coughs> difficulty there. Technically, your world play can do all of this computation for you for free. This gains us about a factor of that's about a factor of two to three improvements by doing selective traversal and noticing what types that we can always skip over. Another thing we discovered with template boilerplate is it makes it really easy <coughs> to experiment with different ways to do, do recursions and traversals. Let's say you're doing a, a writing some code where you want to list all of the names or all of the identifiers in a particular type. OK, that's easy. You write the naive code. You recur on, you cur when you reach an application, you recur on, little, you recur on both children, append those lists, you're done. Well, OK, everyone in here knows that, well, really, you should be doing that with an application, because the, the appending is going to be quadratic. If you've spent, invested a lot of effort in implementing for large data types, that recursion is kind of not very, you don't want to really rewrite the whole thing once you've gotten it working. And especially if you want to do other experimentations that might not be so obvious as to whether you'll get better performance or not. 
However, with template, your boilerplate is very easy to encode these because you're only dealing with a few lines of code. An experiment with different results. And in this case, you get a lot of performance improvement, uh, up to a factor of 10. Now, the cautionary tale. You remember that little blip at the end of the last benchmark where suddenly we're much slower? We looked into that and tried to figure out what was causing it. It turns out that that benchmark, what it's doing is it's doing uh, gensimming all of the integers in a, in a large list of time. So as part of that, we specify what to do uh, in terms of this uh, make m uh, int int. And what that does is when it sees an int, it generates the code for actually doing that gensimming. When it sees a when it sees anything other than that, then an int, it says, I don't need to do anything. Well, we're in a monadic context. The way to say don't do anything is return. Everywhere m, what it does is it generates some recursion. And then once it's done with that recursion, it does whatever make m said to do. Well, a consequence of this is there's going to be this bind return pair. And under the monadic identity laws, we know we can eliminate that. We would expect the compiler to eliminate that, but it turns out that 7, GHC 703 does not. And this is the cause for that sudden uh, decrease in performance. So even though we're generating code that looks like handwritten code, there, we do, when using a system like this, you do need to be careful. There can be these little gotchas. Note in uh, GHC 7.4, the compiler does optimize this away. And for that benchmark, we then do match handwritten code. So with 704, we're, we're meeting or beating handwritten code on all of the benchmarks. Uh, this is, by the way, not a problem unique to us. If we look at some of the other systems, there is a marked uh, decrease in performance on this one benchmark across the systems. This last, last one is actually sort of a request to the community. Template Haskell provides an interface for querying the, the compiler in terms of this reify function. It lets you gather all sorts of information. Unfortunately, it is a very, very low level interface. If you want to ask what are the constructors of this type, it actually takes a lot of code because you have to deal with not just data constructors, new type, type synonyms, which you need to expand in order to get the underlying. And once you've got type synonyms in the game, now you have to deal with type application. There's a lot of code you have to implement in order to implement, a, in order to implement the sort of git constructors you need to implement something like thfoldout or thcase. Similar problems show up for many of the other functions. You would like to be able to get the type of a name regardless of what that name is. Or if you want it for doing memoization, you need to canonicalize your types. This is expand all of the type synonyms and erase all of the kind annotations so that you can test equality in your, mem in your memoization table. So in summary, uh, take the design ideas for, template, uh, for Scrappy Boilerplate, port them across to Template Haskell, and we end with, up with uh, Template Your Boilerplate. It is as fast as handwritten code, and generally is easy and expressive as Scrappy Boilerplate. And this isn't something, some, some pie in the sky implementation. We are using this. Uh, 14 of the passes have so far been converted to use template or boilerplate. And during that, pass, during that process, we haven't seen any large explosion, uh, or it hasn't been a detriment to us performance-wise to move to a generic programming system. Now, I'd be happy to take any questions.